And it was nice to that see you. you stopped on, on the image of the horse. Because, <laughs> um, I, I've written lots and lots of swales. This was Penny Royal Swale, my very first swale. And it was named for a horse named Swale that won the Kentucky Derby in 1984. And so that's how old that piece is. <laughs> wow. That's great. That's great. So how have you been? Uh, we already have some uh, uh, audience join us. Thank you for being there. Charles, A-M-I-R-H, uh, K-H-O-N-I-N. Yes. Hi. Hi, Charles. Hi. He runs yeah, my friend Nick is there. Nice. My friend Nick is, is there. And um, Nancy, K-O-C-H-R-A-N. Um, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, now I would like to uh, read just a short uh, version of uh, who Beth Anderson is to our guests and to our audience. Um, um, Beth Anderson is a, is a composer of new romantic music, text, sound works, and music theater events. Her early work was considered post K-A-G-I-A-N. <laughs> <Sorry. Cage. Cage. laughs> <Okay. Cage. laughs> Non-academic, but more recently, the music became more lyrical while retaining the cut-up quality of the minimalists. Um, all of Beth Anderson's recordings are out on other minds, MSR, Albany, New World, uh, P O G U S. Pogus. And, uh, yeah, Pogus. Pogus. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she has released uh, many, many recordings in many record companies, including also Capstan CDs, Opus One, and many. And Beth Anderson has a very handsome uh, website www.beand.com and so let's see we how did we meet do you remember beth you I and think I, I met you at chamber music america conference through jeffrey james actually and yes he introduced us and then you commissioned a trio for you for the for your trio, and so I wrote that. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. So we met uh, at least um, more than ten years ago. Yeah, that was uh, it was wonderful. I was so, seven, I think. yes, yes. So, how have you been? This uh, we are in this this crazy time right now. This pandemic, this lockdown, this not going out very much. Period. Uh, how have you been, Beth? I have been home. And everything, of course, that was organized for performances from March to June got canceled. But then other things happened. Um, Artist Wodehouse, a wonderful pianist, recorded two of my pieces at, and put them on YouTube recently. And then I'm doing this with you. And then also my CD from Other Minds, namely, was issued in early August. So it's actually been not bad <laughs> that's great that's great so um now tell us a little bit of your musical uh style like you uh like you we said in your short bio uh you you know have different periods of uh different styles so can you just give us a little bit of a uh, little bit sh picture of how you know your musical style starting from and to now Mm -hmm. I don't, don't know where to start, uh, how far mm -hmm. back. <laughs> yeah. But, um, in, when I was um, about 23, I was doing uh, text sound and um, graphic scores and uh, electroacoustic things and semi improv improvised pieces and like that. And that's how I got into doing text sound and coding and um, that went on for quite a number of years. And um, when I was about 29, I wrote Skate Suite, which stopped using the codes as typed scores. I suddenly started putting them on staffs 
because the players complain too much. <laughs> I don't understand why, because to me, I can play an A or a B on a type as well as I can on the staff, but I guess everybody has their expectations. And uh, then my music just became more and more lyrical, but it was always cut up, uh, like the text sound was cut up. I always liked that sense of uh, being able to change. And uh, I thought about it quite a lot, about where that came from. And I think it actually comes from John Cage's radio music, because he had a, that piece was about changing channels on the radio. And right. of course, it had all kinds of chance operations about when you change. And, but when you performed it some places, it would be very uh, noisy and musical. Or if you did it in the middle of Wyoming, I guess, where there's not such good radio reception, then you'd get a lot of static. And mm -hmm. the great thing about the piece was that it changed, and then it changed, and it changed, and it sort of irrationally changed. It wasn't anything like the way I was taught uh, as a child by my piano teacher to write an A theme, a B theme, a development. You know, there was no sonata form. There was no... Nothing like that. So Cage changed my mind. Mm. And, um, and it continued even into the music that is much more lyrical, that it wasn't really up his alley. <laughs> but yeah. uh, nevertheless, I kept that sense of change what you want to about yeah. the music. I'm fascinated by uh, John Cage's music, and uh, the the one you talk about radio is a uh, he. I think it's called landscaping something. Like it's about twelve radios. He had a uh, twelve radio people on stage with a conductor, right? And then conducts the the twelve radios. And but obviously, every radio station and every given performance, it would be different music or different uh, different text or different sound. So. What a right. genius um, to think about that. And you actually studied with John Cage a little bit? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I read his book, Silence, when I was 15, and I was just swept away. And yeah. then uh, he came to the University of Kentucky, where I was studying in uh, the spring of 68, and I met him and followed him around for three days. And he gave me his home number, which was listed. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And yeah. I used to call him when I'd have something on my mind, and he was very kind. Yeah. And then when I went back, when I changed schools, I changed to the University of California at Davis, uh, where Source Magazine was published, and Stockhouse had just been there and all that. But anyway, when I got there, John Cage was there. I didn't even know he was coming. But yeah. so I got to study with him for the fall semester uh, yeah. of my junior year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, now... I am uh, very interested in uh, knowing, uh, can, can you tell us just a little bit of your childhood? Because you're from <laughs> you're born in Kentucky. And how did you start to music? Is your parents musical or your surrounding is musical? How did you become a composer? <laughs> <laughs> that, that started out as a little question. And got bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> it's getting bigger and bigger. Variation, theme and okay. variation. Yeah. I, I was born in uh, Montgomery County in Kentucky outside of Mount Sterling, and we lived on a farm until I was seven. Um, and all my friends were animals. Um, I had a lamb and two dogs and a cat and ponies. And cows and like that. And we, then we moved into the big town of Mount Sterling. It had 5,000 people. And um, I started piano lessons uh, with Margie Murphy, the best piano teacher in town. And uh, she was a very serious piano player. She could, she could play popular music and classical music, and she, all of her students did very well at the state music festivals and stuff like that. But she wasn't at all interested in my composing. And I, I started composing when I was studying with her but I didn't actually get a teacher that knew anything about composition until I moved again to Lexington. And then I had a teacher named Helen Lipscomb, who was both a piano teacher and a composer. She had a lot of pieces published, mostly teaching pieces that her mother wrote little poems in the rhythm of the piece. And then it had pretty covers and things like that. 
but she also wrote things, you know, more advanced things that nobody's ever heard of because I seem to, her family seems to have given me the masters. <laughs> mm. uh, they belong somewhere so much safer, but mm -hmm. hopefully I'll find a place for them. Um, and um, the one summer when I was in Lexington, my band director taught me to write 12 tone music for fun and profit. So mm. I was introduced to the concept that you could have a system, a, a code, a way of writing music that so you didn't have to sit around and wait to have a melody drop from the trees on you. You could mm. uh, figure something out with your mind, right. which was a completely new idea to me, which eventually led to me uh, to coding, to changing words into pitches and words into durations and depending on how you set up the coding. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, I don't know, I've gotten lost. But anyway, <laughs> that, that went on and on. And yeah. I, when I was 12, they asked me in school, what did I want to be when I grew up? We had to write a little paper. And I said mm -hmm. I wanted to be a musicologist because I couldn't imagine that I could be a composer. I didn't, I'd never heard of any women composers. I uh, eventually, I got to play Scarf Dance by Chaminade, so I, yeah. I discovered her. But, you know, she was a dead woman composer. There weren't any yeah. living ones until I was at UK, and um, my teacher, Kathy Atkins, played uh, the Steve Reich LP uh, called Come Out. And on yeah. the flip side was a Pauline yeah. Oliveris piece. And yeah. It was the most exciting thing to discover yeah. that there was a living human being, a woman composer that wrote music and actually had something on, on a recording. So yeah. I was very inspired by that. So uh -huh. by the combination of John Cage and Pauline Oliveris, they were like uh, matching urns on the fireplace of my mind. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Shall we play uh, one of your work to show sure. people? What do you play? Shall we do... Uh, should we do the uh, uh, what do you call the the November swell? Okay, oh, no. that's a that's sure. Uh, let's talk about it a little so yeah. somebody knows what they're listening to. Okay, yeah. It, it was a piece written for the San Diego clarinet quintet. Uh -huh. uh, they had asked me to write something twenty years ago, and when they asked, I said I didn't think I wanted to do that. I was thinking about string. Uh -huh. I was always thinking about, about string, but yeah. I have come to realize that a lot of um, wind players are more in the market for music. String players are inundated with the music of the past, and they're a hard egg to crack to get them interested in your new music. But anyway, uh -huh. Planet players are open. So anyway, when uh -huh. he asked again, I said, okay. And um, a, first of all, you need to know that a swale is a meadow or a marsh where a lot of wild plants grow together. So it's a great name for uh, a collage, a kind of collage of music. And that's why I, I started using that name, actually. Um, like the first piece is also swale. Right, the first the opening piece. Yes, they just absolutely. Did. That was yes. the, the old one from '84, yeah. and this is a yeah. much newer one from like two years ago. So oh, it's, okay. it's very new. So okay, all right. Onward and upward with November Swale. Yeah. Okay. So let me find that November Swale. Okay, uh, November Swale and share. And we'll start with second twenty second.
Very nice. Okay. Great. Thank you. It's kind um, of melancholic because it's yes. November and right. This, uh, Very burning. peaceful. So that yes, there's actually five clarinets just playing yes. this piece. Awesome. Yes, very nice. Wonderful. So um, the really images sense. are very nice too. The whoever did the video, it's very good. So um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about. Um, I had no idea actually you did um, this style with words and you. Yeah, tell me about that, please. Okay, text sound is the use of words and phonemes, parts of words, to make a kind of percussive music and um i got very excited about this in the bay area primarily because of charlton mccania and, and um, tony nazo and other people that i met out there even bob ashley was a teacher of mine and he was always doing things that involved talking but the talking wasn't exactly what i would call text sound but it could be considered that i guess and i my first big piece in that direction was called uh, Torero Piece, and that's out on um, Other Minds CD. It was a reissue of a 1750 Arch Street LP from the distant past. And it's a piece that I did with my mother where the instructions for the piece are you, for the other person to talk about the most exciting person or event in their life. And my mother chose to talk about my father and her relationship with him, which was pretty dramatic. They got mm -hmm. divorced three times before I was seven. So oh my God. <laughs> they were oh my. <laughs> they were very exciting folks. But um, <laughs> and my part was derived from a text sound, from a paint by numbers painting that I found in a used clothing store in San Diego on a visit to Pauline Oliveris. So that's how this all, I was translating the painting into phonemes, e, e, uh -huh. e, e, oh, yeah. rrr, rrr, like that. That's uh -huh. my part. So yeah. it looks kind of funny next to the other person talking about this terribly important thing. And I'm doing uh -huh. e, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so that's that piece. And then when I moved to New York, what I, what changed for me uh, for the Bay Area was that I didn't know anybody, basically. I didn't have access to a recording studio like I had at Mills College. I didn't have a piano. I didn't have a piano for the first four or five years that I lived here. Mm -hmm. All the only pianos I played out were when I worked for dancers. And I, but you can't really play anything of yours. You have to play for them when you're with them. Mm -hmm. So um, I made a lot of text sound because I could, I could write it easily I could perform it myself and I can a lot of the performances were in art galleries in Soho or other kinds of rooms that had no instruments and I had no mm -hmm. money so I couldn't pay people so <laughs> I uh, it was sort of do-it-yourself music the first thing that I wrote here when I moved to New York was if I were a poet what would I say mm -hmm. how about it would you like to hear it please I'd love to if I were a poet, what would I say? What would I say? What would I say? Would I say? Would I say? What would I say? Say what I would I? What would I say? Say say what I? What would I say? Say 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 what would yay? Say what I would I? Say what I say what I would I would I say say? If I were a poet, would I say what? Would I say what? Would I say what? Would I say what? Would I say? Would I say what would I say? Say what I would I? What would I say? Say say what I? What would I say? Say 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 what I would I say? Say say what I would I? Say what I say what I would I would say say if I were a poet? Say what would I say what would I say what would I say what would I say what I say what I say what would I would I would yes 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 I would I would I would yes 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 I would I would yes 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 I would I would I would would yes I would yes I would yes 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 I would I would if I were a poet say what would I say what would I say what would I say what would I would I say would I say what would I say say what I would I would I would I say 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 what I what I would I say 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 Yes, 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 yes,
I would, I would, I would, I would, yes, I would, yes, I would, yes, 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 I would, I would, if I were a poet, say what I would, 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 say what, say what would, yes, would I would, yes, yes, I would, I would, yes, would I, yes, yes, I would, I would, say, 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 yes, yes, I would, I would, yes, would I would, I would, yes, I would, yes, 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 I would, I would. <laughs> and there it is. There's, so. there's actually, there's actually, I hear rhythm, I hear melody also, you know, so. For yeah. sure. Yeah, For sure. yeah, uh, dynamics, uh, very interesting. So tell us a little bit about this uh, recording uh, you have uh, done. Oh, can, you can't see anything. Yeah, I can't, I can't show you because it's too much light. No, it's too, too bright. It looks Let's like see. this. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. <laughs> Mine is like a piece of white thing. Yeah. Yes. It's a very pretty design, and it has a yeah. wonderful um, article inside the yeah. program notes about the whole history of tech sound, the sense of it. And yeah. um, anyway, so, uh, this is a. I went out to the Other Minds uh, Fest Tech Sound Festival in 2018 in San Francisco and performed. And as an uh, afterthought, <laughs> after I did my 15 minute set, I, yeah. um, I said, I'd like to do a small poem to John Giorno because he wasn't there. And I always think of him as a real fixture in, in the tech sound uh, realm. Um, and so I did his, uh, a little poem on his name. It's a magic square. You write the name of the person this way and that way, and then mm -hmm. you go around and you the outside until you're back in the middle, and it makes a little poem. I thought I would do Gertrude Stein for you. The oh. um, the work. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this? No. Looks uh, very white. Hardly. Yeah, it's very white. Yeah, too oh, much light. Sorry, but yeah. in any case, the poem ends up looking like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That I can see. Oh, can yeah. Because it's type. The other thing is handwritten yeah. because I was working it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I think uh, can, there it is. Can you, can, you hold on? can you hold on just one second? Sure. One second. I, I just wanted to say hello to our guests uh, who are watching and making comments. Uh, we have Rain Worthington. Uh, She's also my Facebook friend. Hi, how are you, Rain? So she said, oh, how cool. <laughs> what year was it that you came to New York City? She asked. For. Um, 1975. Oh, 1975. Oh, my God. It was in the middle of the Cultural Revolution. I was in China. Um, and uh, let's see, Nancy uh, made a comment. She wants to know more about the uh, November Swell, whose picture. So I sent her the link of uh, our video, the video we just played and mm -hmm. who else so yeah jeffrey james is there thank you jeffrey um and then we have uh ross cotman said hi oh, to you she's ross. a wonderful yeah. sculptress <laughs> oh she said hi beth glad to see you getting publicity <laughs> yay great peaceful music nancy said uh, my friend uh nick rivera from Connecticut. He's a big supporter of uh, my talk show. He's uh, often there uh, watching us and watching me, watching my guests. He said, beautiful and refreshing. Uh, uh, what's that word? He's a word master. I-D-Y-L-L-I-C. How do you say that? <laughs> Are you good? <laughs> uh, 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 I don't really know how to say that word. Beth? Are you there? Oh, I can't hear you. There's no, no audio. Oh, are you talking to? Are you talking to uh, Rusty? Beth, there's no audio. Okay, sorry, sorry guys, she's she's muted. Um. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Um. Uh, yeah. Okay, all right. There's no audio. You lost audio. Oh, I lost her. <laughs> okay, so um, how about right now, um, how I met uh, Beth Anderson? Um, I'll tell you a little story. I think we, uh, yeah, we 
even met at the Chamber Music America through Jeffrey James. Um, and then later uh, we were looking for women composers work, original work. So I submitted, um, uh, we actually announced at uh, some publication, ask women composer to write for us. And I think Beth was one of the composer who wrote for us. And uh, so I will play you a uh, clip of th uh, that work. Uh, it's called Jasmine Swale. Uh, we gave um, Chinese folk songs to different composers um, and they wrote beautiful string trio for us. You know, string trio repertoire is not as many as string quartet. So for violin, viola, cello, string trios, it's a very difficult uh, combination actually to write because you're missing a second violin part. So you make, like usually for uh, harmonically writing, uh, people like to write for four uh, parts. Oh, she's back. Oh, you're back. Yeah, sorry, we're missing you for a second. Uh, I was just introduced you to our audience about how we met and how uh, you wrote the Jasmine Swivel for us. So maybe we can listen to that a little bit. Sure. Yeah? Okay, so so Jasmine Swivel is, a, this is a, a, a a folk song from southern part of China, um, and uh, it's a very, you know, a beautiful, simple folk song. And, uh, and I cut it up into little tiny pieces and mixed it yeah. in with everything else in the world. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you added a little pepper, a little, you know, <laughs> salt, <laughs> yes. Kenyan. <laughs> yeah, I made it a uh, spice stuff. And uh, so let's see. Um, Beth and uh, Jasmine Swale. Um, let's see, Jasmine Swale. Yeah, so let's see. Okay, so I have, actually, I need to go to here, go to here, go to here. There's a lot of button to push before I go into the right place. Jasmine Swale at audio. Here we go. Okay. Um, okay, so it's kind of starts in a little bit middle somewhere. <laughs>
Okay, we are. There's the piece is quite long, so you guys can listen to it. I can give you a link for that. Okay, so um, can you hear me? Yep, I can. Great, great. Yeah, so that piece actually was based on um, two Chinese folk tones. Yeah, one is a jasmine, and the other one is a, a moon shining on the mountain. So it's a very beautiful. Yeah, beautiful piece. Great, great, uh, great work. So we were about uh, we were talking about earlier um, about the text thing about your um, the CD you made called Namely. Uh, uh, can you demonstrate a little bit about that, please? Uh, I was just getting ready when everything went <laughs> kaflui to uh, to do the Gertrude Stein piece. It's one of yeah. 65 tiny little pieces on this wonderful CD. Yeah. Um, so I'll just perform it for you and it won't take a yeah. minute. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Gertrude Stein, Gertrude Stein, it's a dirt rain. I eat dirt rain. Rit rud est ein. Got rut udest. Said ert regen. I ets i do rut. Rud est ein. Get rud e. Der rut regen. I ets i do. Destin. G e ert. Ru. Rut regen. Let's see. Stuck in grut. Regan let in gi gin I and there it is. <laughs> so the center of Gertrude's existence is yes, in. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. So did you um did you ever get uh uh like a, what do you call a voiceover gig <laughs> by doing this kind of work? No. no? <laughs> <laughs> it's so awesome. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah. I mean, you think I could do sound effects? <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. I Very good. I could make a lot of noise. That's for sure. Yeah. My father yeah, yeah. was an auctioneer. You know. Oh, so. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Was... Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so tell us um, what is um, you teach, right? You also teach. And I different teach piano places. mostly, sometimes recorder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, recorder. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not wind instrument. <laughs> well, so, I, I played flute in band all through from fourth grade into college as I a see. secondary instrument. Yeah. Um, but uh, I discovered later on in life that recorder was really fun and not too hard. And yeah. I love playing tenor. It's really beautiful sound yeah and uh, sometimes there are kids in, that are taking recorders at school that aren't really getting it and so it's helpful to have somebody give them extra help so that's usually what i'm involved in yeah so so you have been teaching piano uh i guess lots of zoom classes since the the, the pandemic <laughs> some yes some? Mo yeah. most of my students hit the road and uh they're not around but i i do have three that yeah. are practicing and yeah. attending their lessons via zoom yeah so how do you feel how do you um what is your experience um the zoom class like the the, the pros and cons of uh of teaching people well, the, the good thing is that somebody comes in effect to my house and uh plays with me you know even if it's C D E F G. It's still somebody is talking to about music with me, and uh, back and forth. I enjoy that very much. I like teaching, and um, uh, some of my students are doing Chopin, so that's very very fun, very pretty. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, uh, for a small child, it's a little hard because you can't take their hand and curve their fingers you have to talk it through yeah. to them and sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't and you could say put your wrist down forever but 
you know, if you can't touch them, it's really hard. So yeah, mm -hmm. right. But I'm glad right. it's possible to do. Otherwise, it, there would just be the sound of silence. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. At least there is an option, right? Even if it's mm -hmm. not the best option. Yeah, yeah. So um, now, in terms of uh, writing music and um, creation, so can you talk about a little bit about your creative process, like? When you write something, um, do you hear something first and then you write it down? Or are you just like holding a pen and a pad and starting to write something? So how does that work? Because I'm never a composer myself. I have uh, very little idea how a composition <laughs> is born, you know? Okay. Um, well, the text sound is easy because it's uh, usually a process of, of mm -hmm. one kind or another. Um, the chamber music and things, um, I usually improvise at the piano and uh, I pick something, I write it down and I write a whole bunch of things down and then I uh, cut them up, <laughs> mm -hmm. sew them back together and uh, repeat things and change things, change levels. Um, so usually if you hear something once in a peace of mind, you'll hear it again sometime, sometimes very soon. So it's, <laughs> there could be the clarinet piece, I think is four bars of something sort of melancholic and four bars of something dancey, and then two bars of one and two bars of the other. And, you know, and then we go off and do something else. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, things change, but I definitely write at the piano. I know it's, um, you're not supposed to be proud of that. <laughs> You're really? supposed to hear it in your head, you know. And occasionally it has happened that I have dreamed something and woken up and written it down, you know, but that's a fairly rare experience. And do you um, prefer write on, you know, music, sheet music with pen, or do you do those uh, notation software? I, oh, God. Oh. I start with a uh, pen and paper and then um, I put it into the computer after I've got a significant portion of the piece done. Mm -hmm. um, and then once it's, once I start using the computer, things move along um, more quickly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's a good thing. And sometimes it's a bad thing. I used to always write everything out on paper first, and then I just use the computer to notate properly um, because nobody will read handwritten scores anymore. They, it has to look like it was um, imprinted in Korea somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So you have, uh, tell us some of the, your recording project you're really proud of. You've made so many recordings. Uh, it's just really amazing. And um, tell us a little bit uh, about your recording projects. Like, like how did you know the idea come up? And then you have to, I guess, get money to do it, and you have to have a label agree to do it. And you have to find musician to do it. I don't know. It's just I think the list got of the general drift, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So tell us a little bit about how. How, how, I mean, you made so many, uh, so many albums. The newest CD, namely, uh, was totally the idea of Charles Abakanian. He thought, he liked that one little piece of mine, and he said, why don't you make more, and we'll do a CD. And so we did, and that was terrific. And mm -hmm. that is a great rarity in the universe that that should happen. The CD that I made before that is, um, looks like that. It's the, it's called The Praying Mantis and the Bluebird, and it's a collection of music that uh, I wrote for Andrew Bolotovsky, the flute player. And uh, it has not only regular C flute, it also has Baroque flute and um, what are those little things? <laughs> uh, uh, it could have piccolo, but I don't think it actually does. It has Baroque flute. Um, it has, uh, it doesn't have, a, yeah, it has a shakuhachi, 
And it has one of those little tiny things. It's like a whistle that I can't think of the name of right now because my mind, you know, goes. Um, <laughs> but anyway, there's so many things on it. And uh, the reason we made that is because Andrew bothered me and bothered me and bothered me until I did it. You know, which works really well for me. I if somebody asks once, I think, oh, I don't know, because some of these pieces were from 79. Um, he was the primary person who made me switch from typing my scores to putting them on staffs because he said nobody in New York has any time to be reading instructions and doing, you know, cooperating with you in the way that I had that has worked for me in California. So then I had to start writing on staffs and it really changed the music. So quite a lot. But anyway, that's what this one was. Uh, the New World CD, which it was a big deal, was so hard to organize. It took nine years of applying for grants. And then I finally got it. Yay, I got the Copeland grant to do it. And Tom Buckner helped pay for it, which was wonderful. He, he gave the, the seed money up front uh, to start the uh, funding and um, wonderful string quartets and my piece, The Angel, uh, on based on a Hans Christian Andersen story is on that. Um, anyway, um, there, that was how that was done. Uh, quilt music, I wanted, I had uh, written these songs for um, uh, a singer, uh, Keith Borden, who worked at Greenwich house music school as um, administr an, an administrator. And he had commissioned these things called Harlem songs. And I thought it would be so nice to put Harlem songs on a record and then have him also sing my cat songs and dreaming fields. Uh, and then we had to fill out the CD and I thought, ooh, quilt music, get Joe Cubera to play quilt music. So we did that. I don't know. Oh. And Pogus put out a, a CD of my really older uh, uh, tech sound pieces and uh, tape music, Ode, that I was written for my father, was, has auctioneering done by his friend Speck Edwards. And it's, it's anyway, it's a fun, fun CD and uh, everything has to do with words on that, that one. What else can I tell you? Well, that's great. Yeah, so can you hear me? I can, but okay. my power All right. is running really low, and I what power? hope we make it oh, on my you mean, phone. Oh, okay. Going low, so, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. We'll talk faster. <laughs> Are you there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Talk so, faster. Uh, yes. Talk faster, yes, yes. So tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about your, do you have any current project? Like do you, what is your, uh, uh, you know, currently what are you working on or you're, um, you know, writing something or you're about to produce another something, another CD? Uh, no. <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um... Well, I'm trying to write some songs based on some words I wrote in the 70s, actually. Mm, and mm. Um, I'll, we'll see how far I get with that. But that's what I'm doing, sitting around here with nothing much to do. Yeah. So um, I don't have um, any performances. I wrote um, a memoir, a mm. book-length memoir that has pictures and tells all the, the story of Beth. You know, it goes from Kentucky to New York to San Francisco yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And of course, I can't find a possible publisher for this thing. And I may end up self-publishing it or I may just put it in a box and give it to NYU to uh, <laughs> to save for uh, posterity. Um, and yeah. <laughs> should somebody run across it before the rats get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, now... I, I, you must have a different uh, idol in different time of of your career, of your studying, or or your you know musical journal. Um, can you name like a two or three uh, musicians who inspire you uh, very much musically? Mm. 
Well, I certainly love all the guys that write really pretty music. Uh, Vaughn Williams and, oh God, those guys from South America whose names I can't think of right this minute. And I have a memory of a flea. If I don't write something down, it's not going to happen. Yeah, so this me is too. a surprise and I don't have any idea. I used to yeah. say it was the guy that wrote all those Disney songs from the really old um, shows. Yeah. Know, uh, Snow White, Cinderella, yeah. like that, um, yeah. because the they were such perfect songs. They're very simple, but just perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they yeah. also serve as a great basis for jazz improvisation and things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so about how about the classical era? Anybody you really love? I love Mahler. I love mm -hmm. Mahler because he's always changing. He mm -hmm. he's. I am feeling so heartrending. I'm going off to war. It's like the horses are coming. The war is happening. But I love her. But I'm not about yeah. war. It's like Lord, <laughs> war and peace. You know, yeah, very manic. I love. Him. I love Mahler. I love listening it's to him so too. So long. It goes on forever. I just yeah. Love yeah. Yeah. I love Mahler too. Yeah. Mahler was too modern for the University of Kentucky music department. They stopped with Brahms. It was mm -hmm. like Schenker stopped with Brahms. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they did too. So yeah. you weren't going to find out about modern music really there. Yeah. Although yeah. they admired Schoenberg, of course, but there was a great break between Brahms and Schoenberg. And um, Cage was amazing that he showed up there. Right. <laughs> yeah. What a, what a great contribution huh, to 20th century music Cage was. Yeah. And just the idea of just like <laughs> three pages of blank music, <laughs> four minute thirty three seconds. I bought that score actually for five bucks, and, I and saw then I it showed at the Juilliard bookstore. It's yes. so funny they had it right out on the thing for you to buy four minutes. And yeah, seconds. I actually bought it because I want to show to my students. You know, I I taught uh, music appreciation at uh, St Joseph's College, and uh, they they at some of them get it right away and some of them like they were just so puzzled you know what's the whole point you know then you have to explain to them and then yeah so it's a really great conversation yeah four minute 33 seconds yeah so uh yes yeah, switch back to the clock a little bit um but refresh my memory i don't remember if you said that like how did you decide to leave kentucky and come to new york city well, there was a step between those two, but um, oh, okay. I left Kentucky um, when I was 18 because I was going to find a teacher. And I, I had, I worked in the music library at UK when I was there. And so I had read all kinds of stuff and I tried to figure out who I wanted to study with. And I had three people in mind. Um, first, I wanted to study with Pauline Oliveris at University of San Diego. University of California at San Diego. And I wanted to study with Ned Roram, now for something completely different, who was at the University of Utah at the time. And then I wanted to study, I wanted to go to the University of California at Davis because of Source Magazine, which I thought was the most exciting magazine in the whole world. And I figured there must be far out and exciting people there. And I got to Davis and of course, instead of meeting uh, the people that made the magazine, I met Richard Swift, who was a lovely man, but he wrote 12 ton music. He was very, uh, I think somebody described him once as an Anglophilic uh, dodecaphonist, <laughs> but he was a very sweet man and he encouraged me to come and in fact I did. And the reason I didn't study with Ned was because I went to, to the university, but I failed to write a letter first. And when I arrived, he was already back in Europe. So I missed oh. him because oh. I was, a child and didn't have the sense God gave a goose yeah. to um, to write a letter. And then I was hitchhiking from LA back to Kentucky at, with a, another girl. And we got a ride from Los Angeles to uh, Mexico. And so we skipped San Diego. And so I figured at the time, it's God's will, I won't study with Pauline. It took me several years after that to meet her finally, but 
Um, so I, uh, I, find, I found the teacher, I went to school, then after that I changed to Mills, I got masters and another masters, and anyway, I hung around in the Bay Area, and then I moved to New York because I got a national endowment for the arts grant, and I wow. said, ah, they told me it had to be used for um, career development. They didn't want to be responsible for anything I might compose, but they said career development. So I said, the best thing I could do for my career is move to New York. So I did. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's a great accomplishment to get a grant from, a, you know, National Endowment for the Arts. There was another uh, mural. Uh, delete event. Is your battery low? Uh, just cancel. Delete event. Delete event. Yeah, re-enter. Okay. Re so now, why am I here again? Hmm? Hmm. Can you re-enter? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, you're entering, continuing. Hello? I can see. musicians politicians uh specialists um if uh if some of you there want to uh talk with me and just you know um write to me my email is jade viola j-a-d-e-viola at gmail.com okay let's see if beth is coming back hello beth yeah oh, I, hello I am yeah, here. I, uh i can hear you Beth, 